So yeah, this is our section, second lecture uh, today, and I've got a couple of announcements first before we get started. Um, one is that, you know, I know some people want to know if they could buy an Android tablet or device or something cheap to test their, you know, apps on if they don't already have an Android phone. If you want to do that, I've got a couple of links to different ones that are cheap. I mean, certainly you could buy a nice one, uh, but I tried to find ones that are like $100 or less uh, so that, you know, wouldn't cost a lot of money. Um, and so yeah, th there's a link to those there if you want to take a look. Another thing is that starting next week we're going to have sections. And um, remember the way the sections are going to work is it'll be once a week, uh, sometime in the middle of the week. We'll have a couple different times, so hopefully the times will suit most people. Uh, you will go with your machine, your, your computer, and you'll work on some little exercise for the, for the hour. And um, you'll be graded on participation. You don't have to finish the exercise. And uh, I'm going to ask all of you to submit time preferences this weekend about when you would be free, and then we'll assign you to a section. Um, I know that it's really hard to find times that work for everybody, and also there's people who don't like to go to sections, and so if you don't want to go, then uh, you don't have to go. But basically, we're going to drop your lowest homework score, and your section participation is a homework. So like, if you don't go, we would just drop that, but then we would grade all of your assignments. And so that's your, uh, your choice. Anyway, I'll send you a message over the weekend about the sign-up sheet for that. I haven't got it ready yet because I'm still coordinating with the CAs about the times for those. Um, we have posted our office hours. We're going to start office hours next week on Monday. We've got different times throughout the week. So, you know, if you have questions about the class, if you have questions about uh, how to set up Android Studio or just anything else, feel free to come to our office hours. Uh, also, you can always come talk to me after lecture. I'll be up here if you want to talk to me. It's always fine. Happy to speak to you. Um, and what else? Uh, we are going to have some special sessions for how to set up Android Studio because I know everybody has to get that working. And if you haven't tried to get that working yet, you should definitely do that soon or at least try to start doing it soon. Um, I will be available today after class. Not, I mean, you know, class ends at uh, 2.50. So uh, I, I have a one short meeting after this lecture, but then I'll be free until 4.30 if you want to bring your machine to my office, I can look at any Android Studio issues that you're having. Um, also, we're going to have Gracie in her office hours next Monday. And uh, I think we're going to add a session maybe tomorrow as well, tomorrow morning. Well, I'll send you a message about that once I know more. Quick question, just show of hands, who has finished setting up Android Studio already? It actually like worked and you popped up the emulator and like everything, yeah? Okay, that's good, that's great. I'm happy to see that. Uh, <laughs> Did it work okay, or did, did anybody run into any issues along the way, or? I'm just curious. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was giving this weird hour about um, unexpected end of ZMIP input stream. Hmm, okay, unexpected end of input stream. Well, <laughs> we, can, we can look at that later. I don't know that one off the top of my head. If you do run into a bug, uh, do check on our on our Android Studio installation page up here. We do have a troubleshooting link with some common bugs. You might want to search that page for the phrases that you're seeing and the errors, and maybe that'll help you find what's wrong. But hey, if not, come find us, ask us, post on our, it was Piazza forum, you can post there. Um, you know, let's try to help each other get this working. Okay, and uh, let's see, what other announcements? Oh, I know there's still some people on the waiting list who want to see if they can get into the class. Um, I'm. I don't have a definite answer for you today, but I think I will either tonight or tomorrow morning. Uh, I am trying to see if I can hire one more CA. And if I can, I can let several of you in. And if not, it'll just be sort of waitlist time. And the only people that will, the, you know, the only way that you'll get in will be if I can convince other people to drop out. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Okay, and I think my last announcement is just that after class, you know, as of the end of lecture today, our first homework assignment will go out. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end of class. So that'll be due at the end of next week, next Friday. Okay. It's an individual assignment. I don't want you to work in pairs on homework one. So those are my announcements. Um, any questions about any of all that stuff that I just said before I start the, the lecture content? Okay, well, fine. Um, so let's get into it. Now, last time we were working on a <laughs> Berkeley admissions app that asks you to guess which number is larger and you get points, right? And we sort of mostly finished it, but we didn't totally, totally finish it. So I want to first start out by finishing that, that app with you guys, okay? So the state of the app as we wrote it before was that it did look okay. Like we dragged and dropped all these widgets on the screen. 
Um, do you remember, uh, what is Android's name for like a whole screen of UI content? What's that called? Activity. It's called an activity, yeah. Um, and what are each of these things like buttons and text fields? What are they called? Widgets. You think they're called widgets or sometimes they're called views. Those are different things. And then, um, you know, one thing I'm going to talk about today in terms of like positioning, moving, sizing, all these things around, that's sometimes called layout. So those are all concepts I want you guys to learn about. Um, okay, so we got the, the widgets on the screen by dragging and dropping them. And remember, in some cases, we modified the widgets by uh, over here on the side, there were like these properties, these attributes that it let us set. You know, so like the text of the text view, we typed in what we wanted the text to be. And this one, I wanted the font to be bigger, so I set the text size to be a bigger number, right? So, you know, we learned that you can like set these different properties over here. Um, what about the clicking on the buttons? Like, what was the general, like, what do we do there to make it so that something would happen when you click on the buttons? Do you remember? What's that? Event. So you made an event. The, yeah, the clicking on the button is an event, and so we made a function to handle the event. And uh, we wrote that function in our, in our Kotlin code here in this KT file, right? Uh, I'm trying to zoom it in so you can read it. Come on, get bigger. Bigger. I should just make the default bigger. Um, so we wrote these functions. And then once we wrote the function, how do we tell Kotlin, I want to run this function when you click this button? How do you do that? Yeah, it's called on click. If you go to the XML and you tap on the button that you want to modify, there's an attribute here called on click. And so you type in or you drag, you drop the box here and you choose the function that you want it to call. Then it calls that function. It has to have uh, a right the right header, it has to accept a parameter of type view. Now, if this syntax looks a little weird, you know, because we're just still learning Kotlin, I didn't spend a lot of time on Kotlin, remember the syntax for variables in Kotlin is you write the name and then sometimes you write a colon followed by the type. So this is like in Java, you would have said view, view, capital V, lowercase v, but in Kotlin you say view, colon, view. So that's like, this could have been called like, you know, uh, Marty. So that would just be a different variable name for that parameter. Um, anyway, you write that function, you tell it to call that function when the button gets clicked, and in these functions that you run when there are events, a lot of times you want to talk to the different widgets. You say, make this button have this text, or make this thing turn blue, or whatever. You want to like talk to the widgets in the Kotlin code. And the way that you do that is you give them these IDs, which are almost like names, and then you can refer to the widgets by ID, and it will return you a variable that you can use that represents that widget. And the variable that gets returned is some kind of object of type button or type text view or some kind of type. And those objects have fields inside of them whose names are the same as these attributes over here in this uh, XML layout editor here, right? So like if I want the text of a text view to change, I set the text property in the Kotlin code and so forth, okay? Um, if I go back here, what I'm doing in this code is when the left button gets clicked, I'm getting a variable to refer to the left button and a variable to refer to the right button. And then I want to actually go into the button and grab the number that's on the button so I can look at it as an int in the code. So in order to do that, I say, hey, left button, give me your dot text turn it into a string, and then turn that into an int. Um, so then once I do the same thing to both of them, I basically just have two ints here. You know, in Kotlin syntax, I could have written colon int on both of these variables. Um, I think we talked about this last time, like why, why don't I have to do that? What do you think it does if I, if I don't put colon int? It uh, infers, it just it deduces that it's an int because it looks at the type that's returned by this function. It returns an int, so that variable must be an int, so it just like figures it out, right? Okay, but if you want to say the type, that's fine. So I get these two numbers as ints. I compare them. If you click the left button, you're saying that you think the left number is bigger than the right number. So if that's actually true, then you win and you get more points. If it's not true, you lose and you lose a point, right? And <clears throat> I have a text view at the bottom of the screen named, who I gave the ID of points. And I set his text to be this string, points equals points. And so down at the bottom of the screen down here, this guy corresponds to this thing in the code here. So I'm setting his text, like if you click here, 
it's setting his text based on what you clicked, right? And of course, it's taking away a point every time because the left button, the left number is not bigger than the right number. It turns out they're the same as each other, so maybe that's a problem. Uh, another thing, like what's another problem with the way this code is written and work, working so far? What else is missing or, or wrong about the, the app as written? What's that? The numbers are not changing. It still just leaves them the same. Now, that might help the average Berkeley student, but I don't think we want the app to behave that way. Uh, if, well, I mean, I still have a negative nine score, so it didn't help me too much. But uh, we want the numbers, the random numbers, to re-roll the dice or whatever every time you do one of these guesses, whether it's right or wrong, yeah? So, OK, how do I do that? Well, just to refresh you this code we wrote, we're writing a class that's an activity. This syntax right here where you say class main activity colon app compat activity, this colon represents the uh, extends concept from Java. I'm writing a class using inheritance that is a subclass of a different class named app compat activity. This is some class built into Android that is compatible with various applications or backward compatible. So uh, anyway, this is our class. This is a field. These are functions. This function on create runs when the activity first loads up. When the app first appears on the screen, it runs that function once. These other ones run when you have events that occur. So when this left button gets clicked, if I want to refresh the numbers on the buttons, what should I do? Yeah. You showed this in the last class. You call the function again. Yeah, we wrote, we wrote a function called pick random numbers. And we said, make a random number generator, pick a next int up to 10, pick two of them, and then set the buttons to use those numbers as their text. So that call, calling this function, I mean, I guess I haven't been commenting, so I don't get a good style score, but like picks two new random numbers to put on the left and right buttons or something, right? Uh, hey, one thing we could do here, you notice in the, in the app when I ran it a second ago, they were both set to one. <laughs> Now, I mean, I, that just was randomly that it chose that, but it chose them to have the same number. It's kind of bad if they're the same number, right? Like, maybe we should make it so they never have a, a tie. So what would be, like, a fast way to accomplish that? Yeah? If the same, just call the function again. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's a couple ways you could do it. You could just say, if the num1 equals num2, you could say pick random numbers again. That's sort of like a recursive solution. Um, if you wanted to do it with a loop, you could just say like while they are equal, you know, something like, I, I think that maybe the easiest way to do it would be uh, something like val num2 equals num, set them equal to each other on purpose. And then while they're equal, set this one to be a, a different, you know, re-roll re it if they're the same as each other or something. So then I set the text of the numbers at the end, something like that. Um, now, you notice I wrote var for num2. Uh, I don't know if you remember val and var. Like, val is a constant, and var can be changed. And so, like, if I made it a val, it won't let me reassign it here, you know? So I make it a var. I think that the sort of noob thing to do is go, well, then val sucks. I'll just make everything a var, var everything, right? Um, that's fine, but I think that the Kotlin-y way to do things is to val your code up as much as you can, just to kind of, it's almost like good practice to say things should be private instead of public as much as you can, and to make variables local instead of global as much as you can. It kind of avoids certain kind of bugs that you could have. In fact, Android Studio is so annoying that if you make a variable a var that could have been a val, it makes it yellow and it puts a little light bulb that says change to val <laughs> and so it like tries to make you change it so it's i don't know i guess one way of coping in this world would be to make everything a val and then change all the yellow ones to val uh, to change make everything a var and then change all the yellow ones to vals you could do that but anyway yeah question um, what if you okay to make like left button and right button global variables oh that's a good question so like here i'm accessing the buttons and also, up here, I'm accessing the buttons. And it seems like that's a little bit redundant. Why don't I just make those into private like fields, instance variables? Um, in this app, that would work, and it would totally be fine. Uh, I'm going to recommend as a style uh, you know, idiom that, in general, you shouldn't store 
widget objects as private fields. And the reason I want to tell you that will be more clear later. Uh, and just like the one sentence answer is if you have an app with like multiple different screens and activities, a bunch of complicated shit starts happening. And one thing that can happen is your private variables can forget their values. And then that can lead to bugs and crashes and weird stuff. And so like in general, we want to have as few private instance variables as possible, and particularly ones that we can go get them again easily. We don't want to make them into private uh, instance variables. And so a really classic bug is to like take these widgets and put them up as private, and then it can break when your app gets more complicated later. So I, I would, you know, even though there's a little bit of redundancy here, I think it's actually a very good practice to have that in this particular code. Um, so anyway, uh, we have this pick random numbers method. We just patched it to hopefully not uh, allow any duplicates. So now we just need to call that after you do this left button click, right? That's what you told me a minute ago. So after I do all that work, I'll pick the random numbers again, and hopefully we'll have a new challenge for our aspiring Berkeley student, right? Um, we don't have any code running yet when you click the right button. So of course, since I'm a 106A student, I'm going to copy and paste this entire function, and I'm just going to change this greater than sign into a less than sign, and then I will be done, right? So of course, that's the way I should code this, right? Do you have any other ideas for how I might code this? And don't say in Java, Hugh. <laughs> uh, I think I heard an answer that sounds right. He, somebody said helper function, right? Like this exact logic, except with these flipped, is the logic for doing the right button, yeah? So how about um, let's pull all of this out and make one that's called like fun check if correct answer or something. I don't know. <laughs> and Here's the code. So I guess I want to say from left click, you'll say check if right answer. And from right click, you'll say check if right answer. But somehow I need to like send information to here that says like which one do they want it to be, the left one or the right one, right? So like how can I do that? What's it, what would you do if you're coding this? Yeah? Could you make the function return a Boolean um, saying if left num if left num is bigger than right num then it's true or false? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think you're on the right idea with Boolean, but you're saying I want this function here to return a Boolean. I think that part I might disagree with you a little bit because I think it's more like I want to send in some kind of thing rather than have this function send out some kind of a thing. Did you have a different uh, suggestion? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> I'm just going to say pass parameters. Just a parameter, yeah. I think kind of the two ideas together. Like maybe, maybe pass in a like, is it left Boolean? You know, like th that's how you say Boolean in Kotlin. So like if you're doing left button click, you say true here. And if you're doing right button click, you do false here. Uh, one thing that the editor is doing, this is a little weird, but like it's showing me the name of the parameter in front of the value of the parameter. I didn't type that is left colon. It did that. It's just showing me, hey, that's what that parameter is for. In fact, the Kotlin language, if you really want to, you can say is left colon true. Uh, wait, oh, I thought I could unresolved reference. Oh, maybe I'm doing this right. I thought you could say it that way and it would let you. Oh, well, whatever. I'll check that later. But um, yeah, I'll pass in a Boolean of a true or false. And down here, I'll use it. So, I mean, basically, this is like is left and that, then you win. Or not is left and the left num is less than the whatever, right? Just sort of update the formula to use that switch flip of which way they want to check, which one would be correct, something like that. You could probably write that a little bit shorter than I did, but whatever. Um, then it should work for both of them, right? Uh, one other thing I want to point out about this code is that uh, up here, I make these variables for the left button and the right button. And then down here, I didn't. Um, I just use the find view by ID function. That function returns a variable that refers to this text view. And then I immediately said it's dot text equal to something. I could have written this out longer and said like, 
uh, wait, why is that indenting over there? Um, I could have said val text view equals that, and then I could have said tv dot text equals that. You understand? But I just mushed it all together and put the like dot right after that there. So either way is fine. It's totally up to you. Um, one thing you'll notice as you're coding is Android Studio will sometimes sort of highlight or underline things that it thinks you should code in a different way. It's kind of like trying to give you some style grading while you're coding. Um, you know, me and the CAs are going to have to decide like how picky we want to be here. Like, do you guys have to eliminate all of these colored warnings from your code or not or whatever? But like. For example, if I hover on here, it says, you know, this function could be private. It's, it's like, you know, a lot of functions in your, in your app could be private. You can say private fun. We all know, we all like to have a little bit of private fun from time to time. Um, you know what I mean. <laughs> um, anyway, so that's why it was underlining that. And I think it's kind of the same thing for pick random numbers. That could also be part of our little private fun. Um, one interesting thing is you might say, well, I'll make all of them private, but it didn't have that same underline on some of these functions. Any guesses why these other methods, uh, why it didn't suggest to me to make them private? What do you think? Yes, ma'am, you. Oh, um, because it needs to be called uh, by the widgets so that would be some other. Yeah, I mean, we haven't learned everything about how Android works, but you've got the right idea. Like this <laughs> onCreate function, Probably some other piece of code somewhere needs to like make my app and create my activity and pop it up on the screen and call this on create. So somebody else outside of my code is probably calling on create to create me. So I can't make that private because then they wouldn't be allowed to call that on me or something. I don't know who that is, what code that is. I don't know, but some other part of Android needs to call that. And same thing with left click and right click. Like I think somehow the wiring things together between the layout and the widget stuff that we doodled on the screen earlier and this class here somehow that like can't be private for those two parts to talk to each other so anyway just we don't have to understand every detail here but like some of these can be public and some of them can be private etc so i think we've addressed most of the issues that i thought we still had with the app um, it should work for both left and right buttons and it should uh pick new random numbers each time and the random numbers should not be duplicates hopefully if we got all that working so let me run the app again and uh, see if it works so again it takes a minute but luckily I already loaded everything up before class so hopefully it won't take as long as some of the previous times if I take roughly the same time that it would take average Berkeley student to solve the problems presented by the app uh, <laughs> Okay, it popped up. Uh, which one's bigger, one or eight? Duh. <laughs> uh, eight. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, one. Oop, no. Nine. Nine. Oh, five. It seems like it's always the right one bigger. What's going on here? Okay, here we go. Nine big. Okay, so anyway, it's kind of mostly working. Um, I guess if I were going to add one more thing, you might, you sometimes want to like display a temporary message on your UI. Like I have some nice permanent messages at the top, there's permanent text up there and down below is permanent text view of your points you've earned or whatever. I mean, you can use the same widget, like a text view, you can show it and then you can tell it to hide itself. So you can do stuff like show it and then later you can hide it. That's possible. But uh, sometimes you just want to like a little pop-up message. Android has a thing for that. It's called a toast. And uh, let me show you, if I go back to the slides, I don't know why this thing always, did I tell it to be always on top or what? But um, if I go back to my slides, where is it? Uh, oh, maybe I don't have it open. Creating our first app, yeah. Um, where? Isn't it here? Display toast. So a toast is a short message. It just pops up for a moment and then it fades away. You guys have probably seen these in apps, right? Like. Uh, if your download is done or your message is delivered or whatever, it'll pop up a little message and then it'll kind of fade away after a couple seconds. That's called a toast. And the way to make a toast up here is to write toast dot make text and then you write these certain parameters and then you say dot show. I think it's a big mess of mumbo jumbo. I wish it were shorter, but this is how you have to do it. So um, that one line is all you need in order to uh, make those toasts appear. So maybe what I'll do in the uh, app back there, I'll grab this line. I'll copy it and I'll go paste it into the app. So here's like where you're checking if you got it right. Maybe if you win, I'll say toast dot whatever. It doesn't like toast, it's in red. What do you think's wrong? 
this will be imported so there's a cool hotkey uh, if you just hover on here it'll say it'll have like a light bulb and you can press alt enter and you can say import so alt enter import so now it's fine uh, in terms of text if you got it right I'll say you got it uh, and then if you don't get it right I'll say uh, uh, you see Davis may still take you I don't know whatever <laughs> I don't know which one's the really bad you see, but I don't know, whatever. Um, uh, so, I mean, these parameters, like, I don't want to spend a lot of time on them, but, like, you can say length long, it stays on the screen longer until it fades away, I don't know. But, um, yeah, let me just run that again real quick. I'll just tell it to, to launch. Um, it's not a very big difference in the behavior. It's just it'll, it'll be a little more clear because, you know, the Berkeley student might not notice whether they got it right or wrong, so it's like... You got it, hooray. Now watch, it sort of fades away, right? <coughs> UC Davis may still take you. you know. <laughs> fine, you know. Okay, fine. So anyway, this is basically a done app at this point, okay? Do you have any questions about this code that we've written? Yeah. Um, if we go back up to the like, check buttons, I'm just not sure why we need to have the view object as an argument in some places. Um, oh, why do we have this view argument? Well, um... It's, I mean, the short answer is just that that's what Android requires. Every on-click event handler has to match an exact header, and the header has to include a view parameter. Um, now, why is that? What does that parameter mean? Well, technically, they pass in the widget that you clicked on. So another way you could have written this code would be you could attach the same <coughs> click handler to the left button and to the right button, the same function, and then you could have said, if the view is equal equal to the left button, then do this, and else if it's equal equal to the right button, you could do that. So that's totally something you could do. So um, why don't I try it? Now you kind of said, like, why do I have to pass it sometimes and not other times? Well, that's because click handlers have to have this function signature. But like down here, these other functions, we just wrote those ourselves. We made them up. It could have any parameters or returns or not that we want, because we made that up for ourselves. But this is like we're fitting into the framework of Android here. So uh, I think if you want to do the sort of unified uh, handler function. Let's just play with that real quickly. Let's do uh, fun either button click. And so we now have view view. So I think what you would do here is you'd do something like, you know, val left button, val right button. And then you'd do something like uh, check if correct answer. And then you'd pass like view equals left button, I think. So in other words, you're calling that checking function, and if the view they click on is the left button, you're passing true, and if the view they click on is not the left button, you're passing false. So that's just equivalent to what these guys are doing. Does that make sense? I mean, that code might look a little weird, but that's, I guess I don't even need to go get the right button, right? Because I'm only checking if it's the left button. But like, that's kind of how you would, how you did that. So now, um, just because I wrote that function doesn't mean it's being used for anything. So if I go back to the layout here, I would have to edit this guy and say to call either button click. And I'd have to edit this guy and say call either button click. So I'm not going to run it again because it's not going to behave any differently. But just take my word for it that it will work and it'll be the same uh, behavior, basically, right? OK. Any other questions? Yeah. So instead of using find view by ID, to use the Android Kotlin extensions? Android Kotlin extensions, I haven't used them very much. Like, I, I don't actually know whether that's better in this circumstance. What extension, like, what does it do? What's the code look like if you use that for this? So instead of that, instead of, like, having a separate variable for each button, you would just do, like, left button dot text equals. Um, like, if I just say left button dot text. Yeah, I mean, I haven't used that as much, but if it lets you do it, it's fine with me. Like, I'm still learning how to convert over from Java to Android. This style of, like, find by ID is kind of the classic style that most app code uses. But, like, I guess if the new version just lets you use the ID, like, as a magical variable name that will appear for you, it's fine with me. Like, I guess the way the code would look then would be, like, can I just say left button here? And then for these, I can just say... So the shorter version would be, uh, let's, let's be clever here. Let's refactor, rename to left button, and then lol delete it. <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? I was trying to change the usages of the variable. Refactor, rename to right button, 
and then lol delete it. Sure, looks good to me. That's cool. I haven't used that as much. Um, I'm still converting over. I'm still learning the new ways, but that's great. Thanks for mentioning that. Um, anyway, so like, yeah, the IDs as of, like in Java, you can't do what we just did there. In Java, you have to go get these guys by ID. In Kotlin, I guess you can just use the IDs as variable names. That's really neat. Um, sure. Other questions? If you wanna like end the game by like when you reach ten points or something, what do you do? Yeah, there's, so there's several different things you could do. Um, you'd have to do some kind of thing here, like if your points greater than or equal to 10 or something like that. Now you'd have to make some change to the screen or to the widgets to indicate that you're done. Like maybe you'd say left button dot, um, I think it's called enabled, is enabled, or set enabled. Uh, wait, enabled. No. Set enable. Why don't they don't have that? Um, set click. I can't always remember the. Sorry. So I think one thing you'll see when you watch me teaching this class is I just haven't memorized more than about five percent of the different property names for these guys. I have to look them all up. But you'd set like well, the way I would do this is I would make that I would gray out the button so you can't click on them anymore. I might then pop up. A uh, text that would say you win or you're done or something like that or a toast that would say that you're done So I guess that's how I do that. In fact, I think this leads into the fact that I can't remember the names of the properties I'll show you my slides that have the names of some of the properties and we can fix it after I show you that in a second But anyway, okay. Well, I tell you what what I want to do here is I want to jump into some new stuff I want to talk about layout. I want to talk about some more different kinds of widgets and like what assignment one is going to be is pretty similar to this sort of stuff. Just put some widgets on the screen and have a little bit of event handling where you display some sort of result to the user. And hopefully what we've been playing with will be enough to kind of mostly get you started on this stuff. Um, let's go back to the slides and let's go to, my first deck for today is called Layout. So let me fix the font size a little bit, there. Okay. so. This topic has to do with like, how do you say where the widgets should go? How do you say how large should they be? Should they be left or center or right? Should they be up at the top or down at the bottom? How do you, how do you specify that in your code, in your app? Well, the old school way of doing things was that you used integer coordinates representing pixel offsets. Like zero, zero is up in the top left corner of the screen or of the widget. And then from there, you would move to the right or move down by specifying an X or Y offset. So like old timey C++ type of code or even older than that, you would say this button appears at X equals 10 and Y equals 30 or something like that. That probably seems pretty intuitive to you guys. It's not a very good system anymore because it doesn't really generalize to all of the different sorts of screen sizes and window sizes. And you know, if you've got a big phone versus a tiny watch versus a giant tablet or, or screen monitor, you know, it doesn't really generalize very well. So we don't really do that as much anymore. What you're more likely to do is some sort of abstract layout description or layout management system. That's what Kotlin does, where you say, well, there's a button and it's in the top middle, and then there's another button that's just to the right of that. And you sort of describe things relative to other things, and you have notions of like alignment and stretching or not stretching or things connecting to other things. You sort of describe these general qualities that you want the widgets to have, and then the layout management system sort of decides exactly what pixel that would be. So that's kind of how you do it on an Android app. I actually don't know what iOS does. Like how do you, when you like position all your widgets on an iPhone app, anybody know how to do that? What does it do? Does it use like a layout of some kind or what? Layout thing, okay, whatever. Um, so, okay, uh, there are what are called view groups. A view group is basically a container that stores views or widgets inside of it. Um, you describe these groups or these things in, um, in XML, like when we, when we do the layout editor, it's basically modifying the contents of a layout XML file. You can have more than one layout in the same app. You can sometimes nest layouts inside of each other. Like you can say the top half of the screen should be a grid of buttons and the bottom half of the screen should be uh, uh, you know, a horizontal row or something like that. So you can specify different layouts for different regions of the screen if you need to. You don't always have to do that. Um, anyway. <coughs> You have these different groups of views, and some of them are activities, and some of them are other things we're going to learn about later. So I talked about how layout is in XML. 
How many of you have worked with HTML or XML before? Okay, like half, two thirds, whatever. I, I don't particularly expect that you have. However, it's not like super duper complicated. Uh, it's a language, it would be wrong to call it a programming language. It's a more, more correctly called like a markup, a data markup language because XML doesn't have variables and for loops and if statements and function calls. It's not a programming language. It's more of a system of describing data that is hierarchical. Things that store inside of things that are stored inside of other things. So XML can be used for almost anything. You can use it to represent a group of people or a set of coordinates in, in stars in space, or you could use it to represent widgets on a screen. The, what it's for is kind of up to you. And the, uh, the language that's used to write web pages was called HTML. HTML is basically an instantiation of XML. It's like a usage of XML with a certain set of tags that have a certain set of implied meaning. Um, but the, the language of XML can be used for almost anything. So the syntax of it is you write these tags with less than and greater than uh, you know, brackets at the ends of them. And inside of a tag, each tag has like an element. So this is a course tag. This is an instructor tag. This is a TA tag. And tags can have attributes, and they can have inner text or inner tags inside of them. And I'm mentioning all this because the layouts of the widgets in Android are done in XML, so I want you to sort of generally know how XML works. So in other words, like, what does this mean? It's like, I'm creating a course. The name of the course is CS193A. The quarter of the course is 19 winter. And then inside of that course, I'm declaring that there's an instructor named Marty Steph, and I guess it's a TA named none. I don't know whose name I should have put there, but, you know, and, and you might say, well, what are the rules? Um, you know, how come I didn't say instructor name equals Marty Step as, as like an attribute like that? Why did I put the name inside as text? Well, I mean, I guess one way to say it is you just decide what you want to do because XML is very versatile. You just use it however you want, basically. Um, another way of thinking of it is like, if there's only one quality of an instructor that you care about, you would probably just make that be the text inside. If there's several, you might declare them as attributes like that, whatever. Anyway, so layouts are done in this syntax, and we'll see that in a minute. If you go to the, the visual editor for your, your app or your activity for your Android program, and then you click, there's down at the bottom, there are these two tabs. One of the tabs, let me show you. One of the tabs, in fact, the default tab says design. That's the one where you drag and drop everything. There's another tab called text. I just clicked it. And now it's dropped me into basically the source code of the layout. So you can just edit that source code directly. And it will also, there's a nice uh, preview panel here and it'll show you. It's, this, is, this is basically equivalent to the drag and drop editor. Except instead of dragging and dropping things, I edit this code and I can just see directly what it would do. So like instead of saying number guessing game, if I change this to say Berkeley game, you can see over on the side it changed our life to show it what it would do. Now of course a lot of this probably looks like mumbo jumbo. I'll tell you what it's for in a second. But if you know how to edit this, that will also update your, your screen, how it looks and how it's laid out. Okay. So far so good. Any questions about... Um, XML or, or any of this stuff so far? I'm told I'm supposed to say, makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> apparently how you get the cool points around here. Um, yeah. So, uh, okay, well, the thing about layout is there's different ways you can do layout. There's different strategies for laying out widgets. One of them is called a linear layout. A linear layout arranges widgets in a single row or a single column, just in a line, horizontal or vertical line. And if it reaches the edge of the screen, it just starts to cut off the screen and you can't see it anymore. So um, I think what I'm going to do, here's what I'm going to do. I don't want to like touch or destroy this beautiful Berkeley app that we've written. So I'm going <laughs> to close this thing and I'm going to make a new project. Uh, so I think I'm just going to call this layout demo. And I'll just mostly press next on everything. I think I'll call this layout. You know, the default is like main activity. I think I'm going to call it layout activity. And then my XML will be called activity layout. 
So we can all go get a coffee while this is loading up. But I basically want just an empty project that I can just kind of play with and just see uh, the layouts and see what they do. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, question. Go ahead. Um, I never saw this, like, the, the weird um, connect, like, the... The springy... Uh, the spring thing but now that I see it, it seems really cool and easy. Is, it, I mean, is there any reason why we shouldn't just use that all the time? Is it just, like, a snobby, like, oh, it's not as cool as, you know, pecking the... Uh, oh, okay. So, so, like, as we're about to dive into doing the raw XML stuff, why not just drag and drop the little springy widgets in the visual editor? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a reasonable question. I would say it's fine to use the visual editor as much as you like. Uh, like on your homework, I'm not gonna sort of ban you from using that. Um, I think one of the main reasons I'm showing it to you is that uh, the, the, the raw editing of the XML to you is because the visual editor can't do everything. There's certain stuff you might have to drop into the code to set. And also, there's going to be cases where you're like editing some app, you're working at some company or startup, and you're editing an existing piece of code, and you might not even be in Android Studio, and you might have to edit it in some shitty Vim editor or something. And so, like, you might need to know that to get along in a code base of some kind. So, I, I think you sort of need to know it. And you, what you kind of alluded to, I think, is probably sort of true, where like, I think like real coders like to do it in the XML or something, but. Um, I don't care. Like I, I think that the visual editors. I mean, visual GUI editors in general have a bad rap because um, they have been really crappy for like 30 years, and <laughs> so people are like, "Well, only noobs use that," you know. But I think that this is one of the less crappy visual editors. <laughs> so I guess I feel like it's not a bad thing to to use it if you want to use it. So I don't know. So, so I feel sort of mixed about the whole thing. Um, so okay, here is my my layout. I eventually, come on. Oh, it's still building, really? Wow. You're gonna hate this thing by the time you're done with this class. Like, you're probably watching me saying it's so slow, but like consistently, students tell me it takes longer on their computer. <laughs> I have a lot of RAM, so um, wow. Where is this? Come on. Okay. Where's my Where's my project? Hold on. Let me close it and reopen it. I didn't do anything wrong, did I? There, okay. <laughs> Why? Also, a really fun thing about Android Studio is just periodically down here, it'll just say like, the IDE crashed. <laughs> it'll just pop up a little toast that says that, and it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and it just keeps going. It doesn't close or anything. It's like, oh, you crashed. Okay. It's like everybody has that one friend who's like, you know, every day there's some new drama or something. That's kind of Android Studio. Like, oh, what happened today? You crashed again? Um, so, okay, here I am. I'm looking at this, this, uh, this layout here and stuff. So I just want to, I want to like emphasize the connection between the, the visual editor mode and the raw um, XML editing mode. So right now on the screen it says, hello world, and it's a text view. And I can, you know, change this to say like, hello... 193a and if I go over here to the text the XML view there's not a lot here so even though a lot of this is new to us you can probably sort of read this like oh there is a constraint layout here with some properties I don't know what that means but inside of that indentation is nesting so like inside of that this text view is here and its text is hello 193a so you can kind of see right the connection between these two and then there's this like preview panel over here if I click this I can sort of see the changes live and I can change it to be like goodbye 193a you know, so I can I can kind of fiddle with this as I go right okay but what I was trying to teach you a second ago was there's different strategies of, of layout one of them is linear layout where things go in a, in a line so if I go back to my editor here why don't I make a few buttons so I can play with buttons so let me get rid of that text view and let me just add a button and then another button and then another button. Three buttons, okay? Let's do one more. <laughs> Let's get wild. Four buttons, okay. Uh, that's that private fun I was talking about. Four buttons. Um, so, <laughs> four buttons. If I go back to my editing mode, I do have buttons for all them, right? Now, I'm telling you that there's something called a linear layout, and if you want to use that, you have to tell Android that by going up here 
and changing this like tag, it's currently called something called constraint layout, which is the default kind of layout. If you change it to say linear layout, did you see what just happened? It just happened kind of fast, but all the buttons moved into a line. Let me undo and it put them back. I, I think the reason they look like that is that's just where I dragged them and dropped them. They just sat there. But if I change this to a, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. what did I just do? I hit the uh, cookie munch button. Wait, what happened here? Uh-oh. How do you redo? Shift control Z. Sorry, I like tried to undo, but I, oh no, where did it go? I lost everything? <laughs> <laughs> One time I taught this class and I was reading my student feedback and I got the most like backhanded compliment. It was like, it's nice to see Marty out of his comfort zone. <laughs> I was like, yeah, F you too, man. Come on. <laughs> it's like, you know, if you said to me, like, you look nice today, what a change for you. <laughs> um, okay, so I have four buttons. If I just change this top tag to, say, linear layout, they all lined up in a row like that. You see that? There's a little more to it than that, but, like, that's a way to get buttons in a line. I'll show you in a second, but you can actually say orientation vertical and it'll line them up that way. So, I mean, there's a little more to it, but that, that's like, you might say, well, why do I need that? If I want to line them up in a row or in a column, why can't I just use the default uh, layout and drag them and drop them that way? Well, fine, you can, you can. I'm just saying like, sometimes you want this because it's easier to describe what you want, or you might run into existing code that uses this linear layout style. So that's what a linear layout does. Um, here are, here's a little bit of code that uh, that is an example of a linear layout. This basically matches the app that we're working on right now. You have a linear layout tag, and then inside of that tag, you have some widgets. So now one thing, maybe I'll, I'll get to this a little more as we go along, but um, in the app we have here, the linear layout is vertical. But within that, like what if right here, instead of just a single button, I wanted three buttons. So what I could do is, here, instead of just this button tag, what do you think I put here? I want three buttons there. Any guesses? Three buttons going this way? To going sideways, yeah. Well, somebody in the back had their hand up. What were you going to say? Yeah, make another linear layout. Make a layout inside of a layout. So linear layout. And it sort of asks me some properties that I haven't talked about yet. But if I just create that, and then inside of that, I put, uh, let me cut this and paste one, two, three. Wait, then this guy, where'd this guy go? Uh, but, but like, you can do layouts within layouts. I think the reason this is messed up is because uh, I think I told this to use the height of the whole screen. If I, I'll talk about heights in a second, but there, okay. I think I got what I wanted. But so do you see like the overall layout is like this, but then in this point of it, I say, no, now let's start a linear layout that goes like this. So you can sort of nest these things and stuff. And so that's kind of cool. Uh, I have, a, as you can see, I have a linear layout and then inside of there, I have another linear layout with buttons in there, right? A little weird, it's called a composite or nested layout, right? Okay, so let me show you some of the different properties you can have here. What's this one? I think this is just another example, vertical one. Um, you can use properties on these different widgets to affect how they, how they look, how they will appear. So if you say uh, that you want the things, if you want the things to align to a certain side of the screen, in this linear layout model, that's called gravity. So gravity pulls things to the left or the center or the right of the screen. So like if you set your linear layout to have gravity of center right, it's sort of like vertically centered and horizontally to the right. You can also set the gravity of individual widgets to left, center, or right, and then it'll sort of ignore the layout gravity and use a different one just for that one widget. It'll override it just for that one widget. So like if I go back here and I say um, for the overall layout here, if I say gravity and I say center, everybody's in the center, including this weird weirdness now. So what if I do like center or right? It's going to look like that. Now, why, why didn't these guys go over there? Well, we could talk about that more as we go along, but like Anyway, this is basically used for alignment. 
because calling it alignment would be too hard. They have to call it gravity, right? Whatever, right? Um, okay. There's also something called weight. Weight is a stretching function. If you want your widgets to appear at their normal looking size, like normal buttons that sort of nicely wrap around the text inside, that's not very hard. But sometimes you want to stretch things to be bigger. And the way you can do that is there's several ways that you can do it. I'll talk more about it in a minute. But one way is you can specify proportions. You can say this first button has a weight one, and this one has a weight three, and this one has a weight one. And the way this works is it'll say, well, OK, the total of all the weights is five. So out of five, one goes to you, and three goes to you, and one goes to you. So it's like one-fifth, three-fifths, one-fifth. So it'll devote, I guess, 20% of the space to the first button, 60% of the space to this one, and 20% to this one. Uh, the actual numbers that you put in don't matter. It could have been 1,000, 3,000, 1,000. It's just you know the sum of them all relative to each one's individual value is all that matters. So I happen to choose these because they're kind of the, the most reduced numbers that would work, right? So I guess I could show you uh, over here. If I make this button have a weight of 1, he gets really big. You wouldn't think one would make him so big, but the thing is no one else has a weight, so he gets one out of one, so he gets like all the space. Basically, they're all fighting over the extra space, and no one else competes with him. So if I set this guy's weight to two, now he gets twice as much as the other guy, and so on. So I could give all of them a weight if I wanted to. By the way, one thing you might be noticing is, you know, if I, if I, start, if I want to set this weight, Technically, the way to set the weight is you type Android colon layout weight equals one. But it has a really nice auto completion. I can't always remember exactly how to spell all these things. So I just type in W E I and it's like, oh, you mean weight. And it suggests the whole thing to me, even though that's not what it starts with. So I can say, yeah, I want that. I want to set it to one. So that's weight for sizing and stretching. Okay. So let's also talk about uh, Android. UIs and layouts have this notion of what's called a box model. Uh, if you have done any web programming, this is very similar to that. Web programming has a pretty similar concept. Like every widget has some kind of content inside, which if it's a button, the content would be um, you know, the text in the button. And if it's a text view, the content would be the text in the text view. And if it were some sort of image display, it would be the image that you're showing. There's some kind of content in there, and that takes up a certain amount of space. Then the widget can have padding where the widget itself has been stretched larger than its content. So that example with the weight is padding the size of those buttons vertically that I showed you. Then you can also optionally have a border around the widget. It could just be a solid line or some thicker dashed line or, or no border at all. And then outside of that, you can set a margin, which is like a gap, a blank space between neighboring widgets. So these are all things that contribute to the size and shape of a widget. And how they come into play is if you set these, you know, you'll see the widgets move around in various ways. Like if I go back here, I'm going to get rid of these weights for a second. So now that I'm back to my original thing, if I click on this button and I say I want a padding of, now how do you specify a padding? If you say like 10, that doesn't do anything. We have to pick a unit. So this auto completer is great. You can just, what kind of unit do you want? Well, I'm not going to sit here and explain all these, but some of them are physical units like millimeters, and some of them are like pixels. I think the unit most people tell you to use is called an SP, which means a scaling pixel. So a scaling pixel sort of gets a little bigger, a little smaller as needed. Uh, so what if I set it to like 40 SPs? Look what I did. A button gained 40 SPs over the holidays there. Um, <laughs> now, you might have noticed when I set it to 10, it didn't really look any different. Do you have any wild guesses why? Yeah, like it seemed like we might be adding 10, but I bet the default, if you don't specify what happened, I mean, I'm just so stupid. I happened to pick the exact default that it already comes with. So it, I, was, I was confused for a second, like, where is it? But I bet if I set it to zero, oh, maybe it won't let you have zero. How about one? No? Okay, well, what if I try 15? It's hard to see. It's so small. 20? Just a little bit bigger. So I, I think 10 must be the default, or maybe it's the minimum. I don't have all that memorized. but. You can set a little bit of padding. OK, so what's the difference between padding and margin? Well, if I set margin margin to be 20 SPs. Uh, sorry, let me set them bigger so you can really see it. So let's do 40 and 40. 
So if you look at it for a second, this one's got 40 pixels of padding, and this one has 40 pixels of margin. It's the same amount, but like the padding is inside the widget and the margin is between the widgets. And I, I've taught about margins and padding a lot with students. I've taught web programming courses where I try to help, because you get them mixed up, like which one's which, you know? And I try to think of a clever way to remember it. And I thought it was real clever one time. I was like, I got it. I'll tell my students that padding is the one that's inside the widget. And you'll remember that because padding has the word in, in. <laughs> and then about like 45 minutes later, it hit me that margin also <laughs> has in. <laughs> so I was like, ah, oh, crap, that doesn't work at all. <laughs> and a decade later, I'm still searching for a good mnemonic device. Um, no, I think that now the way I remember it is like, my dad always used to say after the holidays that he had a little extra padding in his belly. And uh, I used to say, he's still alive, he just doesn't say that anymore. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's how I remember, like, oh, I, I ate a lot over Thanksgiving, I got some extra padding. You wouldn't say, I got some extra margin here. Margin is like, if my clothes are hanging off me, I got margin, I guess, I don't know. So um, padding and margin, you sometimes want to set those. That's if you just, you want your widget to be a little bigger. I told you, I showed you that that, uh, that weight thing, the weight of one and three and so forth, that also stretched the widget. But it wasn't stretching it by some fixed amount, it was stretching it to take up some proportion of the screen, right? Does that make sense? Any, any questions about, um, about the box models and the paddings and the borders and stuff? Yeah. In this case, what's the difference between the border and the margin for the one you used to have? So the border, like, I'm not going to do borders much today, bless you, but like some widgets you can just see like a little border around them and you can turn it on or off or you can set it or something like that. So then the, the padding would be inside of the border, but the margin would be outside the border. So like if this were the border, the margin would be outside of that. Um, anyway, not every, it doesn't matter for every widget. And in fact, some of these things you'll see like a little border on the screen here, but that's just for a guideline for the um, layout editor. It doesn't actually show these dotted or gray uh, lines here when you really run the app. Also, by the way, I wanted to mention, sometimes it's not clear what the context is. This padding and margin stuff, it does that even if you're not using the linear layout. A lot of the layouts use these same concepts. So like the default layout that comes with Android that I haven't talked about very much, it's called a constraint layout. It also understands if you say I want a margin or I want a padding, it understands how to do that. Okay, so that's box model. Um, if you want to set the size of an individual widget, the default size a widget wants to be is just big enough to fit its stuff, to fit its content. And that is specified by saying that you want a width to wrap its content and a height that wraps its content. So like, if you look carefully at the um, XML that we already had, uh, how do I shrink this? If you look at these buttons, they have text on them I set padding, but it also has width and height. So it says width wrap content, height wrap content. That means make the width and the height just big enough to fit the contents inside, the text inside, except for this padding that I specified here. If you change this, the most common other value, I mean, you can just write a number in here. You can say width like 400 SPs. You can do that, or maybe that's too big, maybe like 200 SPs. There. Now it's just going to be exactly that wide. You're not supposed to do that. That's not typically what you want to do. Because again, like different devices, different screen size, different fonts, you sort of don't want to start saying this is 10 pixels and this is 100 pixels. You can sort of get away with it with padding. But again, like the less you use these specific units, kind of the better. So most commonly, you would either say wrap content, which means just make it just the right size. Or the other common value is called match parent. That means use the same value as the thing I'm contained inside of. In other words, if this button is contained inside of this linear layout, this linear, you can see, it's hard to see on the screen, but there's a little blue outline here that goes all the way down and around. That's the dimensions of the linear layout. If I tell this button that I want his width to match the width of the parent, that means make his width be the same as the width of the parent of the layout that he's inside of. So make it take up the whole screen. So 
Yeah, that's if you want a really wide button, that's what you do. Now, okay, if I go back to this nested layout, this linear layout, the one that goes horizontally, it has a width and it says match parent, which means it goes all the way across the screen. It has a height that says wrap content, which means only be as tall as the buttons inside of the linear layout. If I had set this to be match parent, that means this guy becomes really tall and it's just broken and it's too tall. I don't actually want that, so I'm going to put that back to wrap content. Yeah, question? Um, is there a way to do like match parent, like minus 10 or something, or are those kind of Ah, uh, um, I, can't, I forget if you can set a negative margin. That's a really good question. Margin negative 10 SP. I don't think you can do that. Well, like yeah. If you wanted to do like 10 less than the parent size. I understand, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think so. Um, I think what you would do instead is like the part you don't want him to take up, you would add in spacers for that in the layout somehow, and then you'd add him and tell him to fill the rest. So it's like, I don't think you usually specify that here. I think you specify it kind of around him. It's hard to get, it, you know, the more specific and fancy you want, the harder it is to do it. But, okay, I just wanted to point out for a second. So let me turn off this wrap, uh, this match parent here, put it back to wrap content. So now everybody's got their sort of default size. And remember how the outer layout is gravity center right. Now if you look at this guy, it doesn't look like he's right aligned, does he? Well, if I click on that container, if you look carefully, he's taking up all this space here. The buttons inside of him are left aligned. So if I wanted him to be right aligned as well, there's a couple different ways I could do it. How, well, that's one way you could think of that I could make these buttons all be mushed over to the right edge of the screen here. Any suggestions? What? Gravity. Okay, I could set the gravity on this layout. Gravity, no, it's just gravity to be right. Yes, so now look at that. Now they're all over there. Great. So that's one way you could do it. Another way that's a little less maybe intuitive, I think, to you guys would be notice how he takes up the whole width of the screen, the blue outline there that I'm arrowing at. If I change his width from match parent to wrap content, the inner container shrank to be this big, and then the layout gravity of the outer container pushed the inner container over to the right. So he's over there too. So I guess one thing that maybe didn't make sense or wasn't obvious was like, if I say match parent, technically this container is right aligned, but he's so wide you can't see it. You know what I mean? Being left or center or right aligned is equivalent for this guy because he can't move anywhere. So if you shrink him down to fit the buttons only, then right aligning him will have the effect of right aligning the buttons. So there's often more than one way to get what you want in these things, right? Okay, question. What's the difference between gravity and layout gravity? Ah, okay, yeah, I haven't, haven't been super careful with some of my terminology. Um, in here, there's certain properties that have names that begin with layout underscore. And it's a little confusing which ones do have that prefix and which ones don't. I think what I would say is, if you're describing an aspect of yourself, usually you don't have that prefix. But if you're giving an instruction to the container outside of you, you do have that prefix. So in other words, let me, let me give you an example. If you are a container, you would say that you have a gravity, and that applies to all the things inside of you. If you want to have an overridden gravity just for one widget, you say, I don't want this guy on the right. I want him on the left. That's sort of an instruction out to the container that's storing me. Hey, don't make me go to the right. Don't make me go to the left. And so in that case, you would say, layout gravity left. And you see he moved over there. And so I guess the confusion would be, well, what if you had just set gravity left? That doesn't really have any meaning. That means like if there was any stuff inside of the button, it would move it to the left. But there's no stuff inside of the button. It's not really a container. It's not really a layout manager of its own but like that. So that doesn't really do anything. It's not an error, but it doesn't really do anything. So. I guess it's a little confusing because like when you say the width and the height of a button, to me I think of it as like that's, the button decides that, but technically it's telling the layout to please make me be this size. Um, so anyway, yeah, I, I think I guess the best thing I would say is like the slides try to show examples that have the right usage of these different terms and 
if you try to set one of them and it doesn't seem to do what you want, you could try attaching or removing <laughs> the prefix of layout underscore to see if it helps the code get better. Okay. So a lot of this stuff I'm showing you, again, it's not specific to the linear layout, but I start there because I think it's the simplest layout to understand. You just put widgets in and they line up. You know, it's easy to understand. Yeah. Um, so then gravity, <coughs> setting gravity within buttons like that, is that a good way to change the orientation of text within buttons, or is there a better way to do that? Change the orientation? Sorry, the orientation. Um, which side they move to, the text within buttons? I think it's fine to use gravity for that. Um, if you use the default layout with the visual editor when you're dragging and connecting those edges and stuff, it's slightly different, and I'll show you that in a minute. But like, when you're using a linear layout and you want to align the buttons this way, that's totally the way that you would do it. Yeah. OK, so I talked about padding. I talked about margins. This, I already did this, so I'm going to skip this. Um, let me quickly show you some of the different layouts. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, and that's on purpose, because I feel like once you've seen a little bit of this, you can start to kind of play with it or understand it yourself. A grid layout is a little bit like a linear layout, except it has rows and columns. So instead of just one line vertically or horizontally, you'd have multiple. Now, you know, this thing over here is a little bit of a, let me, let me undo that gravity I did there. This thing is a little bit of a grid because it's like a row and then this is like a column. But if you really want like, you know, X by Y column rows or whatever, that's where you'd use a grid layout. It looks a little bit like this. You make a grid layout tag. And you say, I want this row count and this column count. And then you just slap all the widgets in there, and it'll, it'll sort of lay them out. All the other stuff I taught you before still applies. Like, the buttons don't get stretched to fill the individual rows or columns unless you want them to, unless you say so with the, the, the you know, um, weights that we talked about. You can stretch them that way, right? Okay. There's a couple of other layouts. Um, let me see. Let me skip ahead a little bit. There's, there's some stuff I'm kind of skipping where, like, you can set a column span or a row span, so like one widget will eat up two columns or three rows or whatever. You know, I'm, I'm kind of just going to give you some slide documentation for some of this stuff if you want to look it up. Um, there's another one called table layout that's also basically rows and columns. It's basically the same as grid layout. It's pretty similar anyway. Um, I talked about how you could have nested layouts with outer layouts and inner layouts inside of them. I basically described that to you already. We already did an example of that. So I mean, I, I often will show this slide and say, how would we get this on the screen? So like, what are, I'm not going to code it with you guys, but what are the different layouts we could use for, for to make the screen look like that? Like, what would you set as the overall outermost layout of this uh, screen? Yeah. So like a linear vertical layout for the overall screen. So that's like all of this. OK. If I just start adding buttons to it, it won't quite come out looking that way. What, um, what inner nested layouts would you put inside of that? For these three buttons here, like a horizontal linear layout here with centered gravity. Any others? It's true. You could use a grid for this part with three rows. That would be fine, too. You'd have to set a row span and a call span for the first two rows. Um, you could also use a horizontal linear layout for this, too. That would be fine. So anyway, there's not just one way to do it, but that's kind of how I would say you'd do it. Um, I want to talk about the layout that comes with Android Studio. When you just first load up a new project and you start dragging and you saw those like stretchy, springy things and I was attaching things to things last time, last lecture, that's called constraint layout. And uh, it's kind of newish. It's funny because um, Android Studio has been around for a while, and it has had a visual layout editor for a while now. But they, I think, felt like the editor was clunky. And part of the reason they felt it was clunky was that the layout itself didn't very well match the dragging and dropping that the person was doing. And so they kind of invented their own layout that was very amenable to visual editing and dragging and dropping like we would do. And that's called constraint layout. So uh, that's the default, and that's kind of the mostly officially recommended layout nowadays. Now, you might say, well, if this is recommended, why am I learning about linear layouts and grid layouts and whatever? And I guess I would say you still can use all these other ones in lots of different cases. And um, you're still going to see code out there that uses all these different kinds of, of layouts. But let me talk a little bit about how the constraint layout works. 
So constraint layout is based on the idea that you anchor corners or, 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 or edges of widgets to edges of other widgets or other things. So a widget has a left and right edge and a top and a bottom edge. It also has a point in the vertical axis called the baseline, which is like if there's any content or text inside, what's sort of the bottom of that content? Because sometimes that's how you want things to line up if you have text or something. Um, there's also a, uh, an alias for the left edge, which is sometimes referred to as the start edge, and the right edge is sometimes referred to as the end edge. The reason for that is because um, there's a lot of languages that don't read left to right, they read right to left, like what, uh, Hebrew and Arabic and some Asian languages like read right to left or other directions, and so you sometimes want to write your code, like if you're doing international apps, you want to say this is the starting part of the widgets and this is the ending part, and then in certain localizations they would flip them or something. But anyway, mostly you have a left, right, top, and bottom. And so when you're writing code with a constraint layout, you basically specify that you want to constrain a widget by attaching its this edge to that edge of another widget. <laughs> and so you're basically saying my right edge should be next to his left edge. So line us up like that, you know? So um, if you want something that looks vaguely like this, I guess I wanted to talk about how you achieve some of these effects using the default constraint layout. Now, you might find that you like it better at the constraint layout, or you might find that this was easier. I don't know. Like, I'm not trying to you know, tell you which one's the best one or whatever. But if I go back and I say constraint layout, <laughs> so all the, everything got all messed up. So let me go back to the, the design view here. Um, so what do I have? Actually, I'm dragging around this whole, this is the inner layout, and I'm dragging that whole thing around. So I think what I wanted was I wanted everybody right aligned. That's what I had before. So what you do is you click on the button, and it has a little dragger on the right edge, and I grab it, and I drag it, and I drop it on the right edge of the screen, and I let go. So just to make it easier to understand, let me set the layout of this guy to be like, first button. If I go back, I, I think it's useful to like fiddle around in here and then go back to the XML and see what it did, you know? So if I go back to the XML, I've got first button, that's this guy, and let's just look at like what it set for him. It set that it wanted, so that's this guy over here, uh, that's this button right here. It set that the end of him should be attached to the end of the parent. I mean, that would be equivalent to saying the right of him should be attached to the right of the parent. It's using start and end because it's trying to be well behaved for these different countries and languages and stuff. But So now, if I want the button to stretch to fill the entire screen, equivalent to like the um, width equals matching the parent like I showed you before, there's a different way of doing that with the constraint layout. You can say, I want to set his left side to be attached to the left of the parent. Wait, why didn't it do it? And maybe I have to do it over in the editor here. If I, if I go over here and I grab the left and I drag the left over here and I attach that one too. Oh, so actually, sorry. It, it now attaches, it's like you have two springs pulling at you from each end. So basically that centered it because I sort of made the left edge pulling it and the right edge pulling it both, okay? If I remove either of these attachments, I say, ah, I don't attach to that anymore. I don't know how to detach it, but if I, if I take the end one here or the right one here and I delete it, do you see now he went over to the left side of the screen because he's not anchored to anything on that side anymore? So I think it's getting a little confused between switching back and forth between the two views. Here, go there. So he's kind of centered. If I want him to fill the whole screen, I can still use some of that stuff I taught you before. If I go back to the, um, the text view here, you'll notice that his width is set to wrap content. Well, just like I taught you before, if you say match parent, now he's just as wide as the whole screen. And you might say, well, if his width is the same as the whole screen, why do I have to attach him? Why do I have to set his start or his end or his left or his right or whatever? The constraint layout requires that every widget has to have its vertical edge attached to something and its horizontal edge attached to something. You don't have to have all four, but you have to have at least one of the vertical edges attached somewhere and at least one of the, one vertical, one horizontal has to be attached somewhere for it to work. If you don't attach it to anywhere, do you notice that a lot of these buttons are underlined in red? If you, if you hover on that, it says, this view has not been constrained. 
Um, or if you like hover on this one here, it says the view is not constrained vertically. So you notice I was in the, in the editor over here. I attached the left edge and the right edge and stuff, right? I didn't attach the top or the bottom to anything. This is where I think it gets a little confusing for new programmers. It sure looks like it's in the top there, doesn't it? We put it there. But basically when you drag it from the palette and drop it on the, on the screen, it just leaves it there. But technically it doesn't know where it should be. And so you actually have to anchor it to something or else it won't run. It won't actually compile. So if you really want it to be at the top, you have to grab the top edge and drag and drop and let go like you're attaching it to the top of the layout of the widget. And now you see that the blue circle filled in on the top there. Now it's anchored. You might say, well, now I got the left and the right and the top are all attached to something. Do I have to attach this to the bottom here? If you do, you're going to center it. Do you see that? I actually don't want to do that, so I'm just not going to attach the bottom. You don't have to attach all four sides. You just have to attach one of the vertical sides or more and one of the horizontal sides or more. Okay? Now everything else follows from there. If I want this second button to be underneath the first button, I grab the top, I drag this over, and I say, you link to that. <laughs> now it's still not constrained horizontally. If I want him right aligned, I grab this, and I pull it over there, and I let go. You see that? Uh, somebody's uh, hand was up. You have a question? Yeah. yeah, so how do you get it kind of like offset to the right a little bit? Um, you know, not all the way to the right, all the way to the left or in the dead center. Right. So if you want it mostly on the right, but a little bit offset, you, you see, does it see how it says eight here? Like you can still have margins. So over here, uh, sorry, let me make it a little more clear. So like this button here, let's call him second button. Okay. Now back in the XML, it says second button. And the margin here says 40 SP. So you can still play with these margins. It says margin top, 8 DP. So if I change it from 8, let me, let me turn off the 40 one because I think it's a little confusing. So the guy's right there. He's attached to the bottom of there. If I, instead of 8 DP, I say 20 DP or 30 DP, now he's pushing down a little bit more. And if I want him a little bit away from the right edge, I'll say that on the bottom, do I already have a margin bottom? I have a margin end. Sorry, I meant to say margin uh, on the right. They call it end, but right would be fine as well. If I said 20 SPs or DP, DPs are display or device pixels or whatever. So if I set a margin on the right or on the bottom, I'm kind of moving to that side away from that edge. So it's an instance where you have to use the text portion of the layout to like, is there any oh, oh it, can you, in the editor, the visual editor, I think you can set these. Um, over here, is it this? I kind of forget how you, I don't use this that much, to be honest with you. Like, if you say view all attributes, it's all in here. Like, if you say uh, margin, I don't know where the margin is, but it's somewhere in here. You can, you can set most everything in the visual editor, but like I get sick of looking for it, so I just come over. I know what I want to type. I just come over here and I type it, and then I just watch to see if it updates properly the way that I expect. Okay. So anyway, that's sort of the difference between the default layout and the, some of the other ones that I showed you. I think whichever kind of layout that you use, it is helpful, and you were asking me about would you use the visual editor or the text editor. I say they each have their strengths and weaknesses. It's really nice to be able to play and drag and drop things in the visual editor and see what it does, sort of to map what you see to what code you need. But also, if you already know kind of mostly what you need to code, I, I end up being more productive if I just type some of that in with the auto-completion and it just appears the way I want it. Okay, so we're almost out of time. Uh, I'm going to show you what your first homework assignment is going to be. Let me just pop that up on the screen real fast here. It's, uh, I want you to write a number guessing game. Uh, I sometimes assign this in 106A, so it's not meant to be like that hard algorithmically. I want the computer to think of a random number from 1 to 1,000, and the user can type in guesses. And if you type in that guess and you submit the guess, the program will tell you if the guess is too high or too low until you get it right. So this is a great binary search uh, thing. But, but you don't have to code this. <laughs> this is the assignment, but if you don't want to do this, you can do anything you want, and I will take it, as long as it has a few widgets and a few events and a few different fonts and things. There's a list of constraints on the spec here. So if this is not exciting to you, you can come up with a different homework one and do that. This will be due next Friday. So I'm going to stop there. If you need help with Android Studio, I'll be in my office. Thanks.